Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, no problem. Just to let you know how it is organized, I'm going, I'm going to introduce the theme for, for <laughs> some of uh, like uh, 10 minutes or so. Joel and then Fine and Leanna, they're going to talk about 50 minutes each. And then we are going to open space for discussion. So uh, this table, it's about the, um, the causes and consequences of the far right. So before we start, I think it's very important to explain to everybody why we have chosen this topic. And the thing is that we think that the ascension of the far right can tell us a lot about the current phase of the capitalism we are living in, and also about the challenges we will face if we as scholars, as young students, we have to uh, want to build more sustainable, stable, and uh, uh, socially just modes of living. Um, so as we all know, in the last few years, there have been this growing uh, movements about on uh, related to populism, to the far right, to uh, dissident left. Anyway, in levels that our generation, at, at least, has never seen before, and we think that the usually explanations we see in the newspapers they are not enough. I, I think that when everybody reads the causes and consequences of the far right, think uh, they are going to talk about the losers of the globalization, how unemployment, how the effects of neoliberal policies, they have been making people more insecure, afraid, and making them support more radical pro pro uh, programs. And yes, we don't discard this idea, but we think that the issue is much deeper than that. And we want to, to, to put this in a, in a bigger perspective. So the, the first problem in discussing populism and the far right and all these issues is that they are extremely complex. Scholars have been arguing about definitions and causes for a long time now, so you shouldn't expect anyone here to give a straight answer on that. But um, let's take populism, for example. Populism has been used to refer both to Bernie Sanders and to Donald Trump and to Hugo Chavez and to the far right in Europe. So what is populism? What is the far right? It's, it's very important for us to, to define and to contextualize before we analyzing, otherwise we will fall into like meaningless discussions. Uh, so, I, but just to make a point here, I will get a very broad definition of Miller, that I found in Miller, that I think it's, um, it's a good way to think what these movements may have in common, and Miller said that populism can be identified by first, having a very charismatic leader. Uh, second, a position when uh, they propose they represent the people against an external enemy, either China, the immigrants, uh, fi the financial elite, anything. Uh, they, appeal, they appeal to emotions uh, rather than rational, rational arguments. And um, they, they have a really strong rhetoric of wanting to break, to, rip, to, uh, to break with the system to break with the status quo. So I think, given this broad definition, it would be interesting to think on how we can escape the, these uh, regular explanations on the losers of globalization and think about uh, how these transformations in the last 40 years, uh, at least, they, have, uh, they can give us uh, more inputs to think on the ascension of the far right. And by discussing with our colleagues and and reading something about it, we we have at least four. Uh, we have at least three issues that we would like to raise, just to just to to foster the debate. Um, so first, we would like to to say oh, uh, we could think, for example, uh, how in the last four years neoliberalism, financialization, uh, globalization, all these processes. Many scholars argue that they only can thrive by changing the way we think, changing the way they, we behave, by making us more individualistic, more competitive with, with each other, and this, of course, leads to a crisis of identification uh, with one another. Uh, another thing would be how finance can uh, lead to can yeah can lead to. Uh, withdraw of credibility in a, in a representative democracy. And the third point would be how a apparent change in the, in the locus of wealth creation from production to finance, which is progressively, it's not like 
from zero to 100 from one sector to the other, but uh, we see that there, there is some changes there, how this could be impacting um, global production, global employment. So we will talk about this very quickly because we want to give the floor for our speakers. Um, first about, it's obvious that the essential of the far right is a crisis of identification and a crisis of representation. So in the case of a crisis of identification, like I said, if we live in a, in a world which is uh, each time more individualistic and competitive, we, we lose our, our capacity of realizing that, for example, now, um, we see that people, each time more people from different backgrounds, different ages, different generations, different origins, they are sharing the same, uh, very similar aspirations. I think, uh, at least I have the feeling that now, uh, people, very different people, they want to have a stable job, they want to have their affordable house, they don't want debts in the bank. And by fostering individualism, competition, we, we kind of lose the, the, the ability to realize that our aspirations might be much more common than we think they, the, than we think they are. Uh, of course, this, uh, this facilitates the discrimination, the la uh, lack of uh, mass mobilization, the creation of scapegoats, and this has been a very, a very fertile ground for the, the ascension of the far right, for the discourse of the far right. When it comes to a crisis of representation, I think this should not become a, a surprise. Once we have a, a representative democracy, which is constantly subordinating the interests of uh, the ordinary, the majority of the population to, uh, towards the interests of uh, big uh, of finance, of big corporations, uh, through processes like revolving doors, financing campaigns, uh, and so on. And finally, uh, we could also wonder in what extent uh, the economic outcomes that justify uh, these movements, at least, uh, as the newspapers puts it, like uh, problems of growth and employment, how they, they can be related to a, a, a change in the locus of wealth creation when uh, economic production and global production is changing in the, um, in the context of a growth of finance-led capitalism. And I think uh, our speakers can talk a little bit more about that. At least, like Joel will know. That I know that he will. And so, I will get to my final point here. Uh, I want to put some thoughts on the consequence, what we could expect in the future. Of course, these answers are are not not uh, totally understood yet. Uh, of course, they are not being solved. So. Uh, we will probably likely uh, come to these uh, discussions of the far right uh, very often in the future, at least for the next years. So the problem is that there is no a priori condition that uh, these alternatives will be better off in terms of uh, democracy, in terms of uh, redistribution and so on. In fact, history tells us that many attempts to break with the status quo and to break with the market, uh, market economy the most of, like many of them have not been led to necessarily better outcomes so it is our job as economists to think about these alternatives because as uh, Slavoj Zizek puts it and of course uh, it appears here in the last uh, yesterday uh, it's very easy today to be anti-capitalist uh, anti-elitist everybody knows that uh, everybody said it's not working that's not good the way it is but we have a lot of difficulty saying uh, what we want to put in place instead. Uh, we, we, we know what's not working, but to build a program and actually know what we want to do, um, it, it's not clear yet, and, um, and it's our job to, to think about that. So, um, yeah, and I would add to, to him, uh, even if we, want, we, we know how to do it, when we see the power of finance and globalization and big corporations today, at least when I talk to my college, colleagues, we have this feeling that these, they, are, they are so powerful, that it's so difficult to break with this, that we get hopeless. So uh, we, think we need to think uh, not only on the alternatives, but how we could implement them in practice. 
So, okay. Now I will pass the floor to my, to my, I will introduce my, my speakers. Uh, first, Joel Havinovich is also a former student of VPOC, and he's now doing a PhD in Paris 13. He is from Argentina, and he's now working with offshoring and financialization of non-financial enterprises. Uh, ben Fine is professor of Marxist political economy and world development at SOAS. He has more than three decades of publications, and I, I, I gave up on trying to list every, anything, everything, but it's Marxist theory, macroeconomics, developmentalism. He's currently a major reference in financialization and neoliberalism, uh, including how to frame them in relation to state action and to public policies. Lena Lavinas is professor of welfare economics and Latin American development at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and a fellow of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Berlin. She has a long path of political activism and teaching and gender and social policies, and she has just launched a book on the takeover of social policy by financialization in Brazil. So, yeah, I will pass the floor now to Joel, 15 minutes. So, hi everybody, good morning. I'm glad to see so many faces at this moment of the morning and I really hope that I can keep you awake. <laughs> um, the idea, I mean, the idea of these tables was to somehow show how, um, I mean, what people from, from the alumni have been working on. So, I'm going to, to talk about a little bit. I mean, obviously, it's many things uh, you already know, but okay, let's see, let's see what happens. So my presentation is called Financialization and the Broken Promises of Capitalism from Wilson's Promise to Reed's Hypocrisy. So um, this, uh, these broken promises, I took it uh, from, from a political scientist, from an, an Italian political scientist called Bobbio, and it's basically to show the difference, the contrast between what has been promised and what has been actually delivered by, by, by democracy, because he basically says that the appeal of populism rides on these broken promises. So he basically lists uh, six broken promises. The first one is this centrifugal instead of uh, centripetal power, meaning that uh, political power is not uh, concentrated in the state as uh, it should be thought, but I mean, we have put many centers of political power within society. And connected to, to this idea, uh, he talks about the prevalence of neocorporative instead of so-called national interest. He also talked about the, the persistence of oligarchies, the, the spaces excluded from democratic deliberation, invisible power, meaning decisions taken behind closed doors, and finally, the, the, the prevalence we, we have been witnessing in the last couple of years of passive rather than active citizens. Um, however, as, as uh, I mean, this is not be, this is have not been the, the the only broken promises, and as you can imagine, I'm not working on on political science. So now I'm going to turn to other broken promises, and it's what I call the the demise of Wilson's promise. So you probably w uh, are wondering, well, who is this Wilson? Well. Charles Elwin Wilson was uh, the, the president of General Motors during World War II, and he was in charge of the, uh, directing the, the company in the, in, in the World War II, which eventually earned him a medal of merit in 1945 and 1946. And he was still a head of General Motors when President Eisenhower selected him as Secretary of Defense in 1953. The problem is that uh, his nomination sparked a controversy because he basically uh, owned a, a large stock holding of General Motors, which he 
uh, which he didn't want to sell, obviously. And during the hearings, when uh, he was asked if he could make a decision as Secretary of Defense that would be adverse to the, to the interest of General Motors, he answered that he couldn't conflict, uh, he couldn't conceive such a conflict of interest because for years I thought that what was good for our country what was what's good for General Motors and vice versa. The difference did not exist. Our company is too big. It goes with the welfare of the country. Our contribution to the nation is considerable. This is what I put as Wilson's promise and uh, has been actually been misquoted as this famous phrase of what's good for General Motors, it's uh, good for the country. And if we think in which ways we can put this promise, I mean, in a more like macroeconomic terms, we can see this uh, graph by, by Lasonic, and it's this famous uh, strategy of the companies of retaining and reinvesting the profits. So we can see that basically the workers could get some part of the profit, uh, of the general profit of the economy in the sense that their wages were increasing with the, with the productivity. However, the demise of Wilson Promise, as you all know, is this increasing gap in the relation between productivity and, uh, and the real wage of, of workers. So now, instead of uh, this Wilson Promise, uh, we have the demise on Wilson Promise, and we also have what I put as the ascendancy of Reed's hypocrisy also known, as you everybody know, of the, this idea of the shareholder value orientation. So, again, who is this uh, read? He's still uh, a CEO, not from General Motors, but from Pfizer, who said in October 2015 that a U.S. high taxes rate meant Pfizer was competing with one hand tied behind the, their back. And in fact, in the, in the next month, in November 2015, um, he intended to, to merge Pfizer with uh, another company called Allergan uh, by $155 billion that would in fact create the, the biggest uh, drug maker by sales in the world. And the only purpose of this uh, merge was to relocate the company and pay lower taxes. The deal was eventually derailed by the U.S. authorities um, because they tightened the, the tax regime in, in April 2016. But the question is, is, is this really the case? I mean, is really Pfizer competing with one time behind their back? So, I mean, these tables I took also from, from la, a, a presentation by Lasonic, and there is some information uh, for the company. And we can, what we can first see is the enormous, enormous amount of money that this company is using to buy back uh, their own shares and, and distributing dividends to, to shareholders. I mean, since 1995, they have spent more than $200 billion, so it's more or less like all the external debt of Argentina. It's a lot of money that they've been spending on, on that. We can see, in fact, that also the, um, the money they have been using to distribute to shareholders has been increasing, obviously, in the last couple of decades, and they are actually uh, distributing more money than their net incomes. We can also see that um, they eventually started using more money to do that instead of uh, doing research and development, and finally, we can see that this idea of the high uh, corporate taxes is not really the case because, in fact, they, are, uh, they could uh, distribute more money even though these uh, large taxes they are, they are forced to pay. So, obviously, this is not the only example of uh, non-financial corporations uh, distributing, distributing money to shareholders. So, we have the cases of high-tech companies such as IBM, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Microsoft, and Cisco, who at the same time that they are laying off thousands of experienced employees, they are doing billions of dollars in buybacks. We have also the example of petroleum refining companies such as ExxonMobil, who is the, the biggest uh, in terms of the, the distribution, instead of 
uh, buybacks, who they do massive buybacks while taking government subsidies for oil exploration and neglecting investments in, in alternative energies. And we finally go back to where we started, that is General Motors, that uh, they have spent 20 billions in, on buybacks from 1986 to 2002. At the same time, they were losing market share, and they agreed to do 5 billion in buybacks in 2015 and 2016 after a group of hedge funds represented by the main architect in the Obama administration 2009 bailout GM demanded 8 billion in buybacks and a seat in insurance motor board and yet US taxpayers have lost 11 billion bailing GM out of bankruptcy while auto workers gave up multiple of that amount in jobs and different kind of benefits so I mean, and this is where my, my, my research enters. And uh, I mean, this is obviously, as you all know, a, a generalized situation. So in this slide, uh, we can see the, the different uses of cash from US non-financial corporations, seen of listed non-financial corporations. And we can see that uh, since 1971, the, the proportion of capital expenditure has decreased a lot, and it has, uh, at the same time, used that money to uh, acquisitions, that it's the brown line, and the orange one is uh, buybacks. So for example, in 2016, they spent 400, I mean, since 2010 to 2015, they have spent an average of 430 billion dollars in buybacks per year. So again, it's a lot of money. So this is another thing I've been working on. I mean, it's, and it's basically how this this change in the way non-financial corporations are run affect the, their asset structure. Again, we can see a, a decrease in in the net property, plant, and equipment of the corporation which is met especially by a, a, a high proportion in, in intangibles. And this is another graph showing not listed corporations, but, dom but domestic corporations, in which we again can see a, a huge decrease in the depreciable asset, met by an increase in, in intangibles, and especially in this category called other investments and loans, which there are many kind of assets there, but FDI is especially an important one. And here we can see a, a division in terms of the size of assets. And uh, the, the most important change are obviously located in the, in the biggest corporation. I, I won't talk much about that because there is not much time, but uh, the decrease in, in, in net property, plant, and equipment is especially important for uh, the big corporations. So. Some, some final remarks uh, about this whole story. Um, it's interesting because dividends and, and share buybacks uh, imply a double increase in inequality because they make both uh, the rich richer and we can say also the poor poor because I mean this whole amount of money is not used to other like uh, purposes and they obviously have a lot to do with the, the, this growing discontent, which uh, I think other, uh, other people in, in the table will talk about a little bit more, which is uh, canalized in, in the wrong direction. And what I think is interesting about this, uh, this, this strategy is that they are obviously frequent practices, and, and in that sense, they, they represent good opportunities to catch non-financial corporations red-handed uh, instead of waiting like for, for big scandals. I mean, the, these are kind of things they are doing basically all the time. And paradoxically, paradoxically they are like relatively off radar uh, for unions, and they have been also like relatively off radar, for example, in, in Bernie Sanders' campaign. I mean, I, I understand it might be difficult to put it uh, in, in a campaign, but I mean, it's such a strong thing that I think it will be interesting to see how it can be told to, 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 to the public. So basically, that's it. Thank you very much.
want to just start? So, good morning. Uh, I'm going to read to uh, stick to the time that is allocated to me. So, though extremely pleased to be here today in this magnificent city, enjoying the summer in Italy and meeting all of you, I nonetheless fear that I should have demurred in accepting the challenge of sharing this session with Ben Fine, that great guy, Joel and Anna, that great guy we all lavish with praise, since the topic in question is marginal to my academic concerns and my current work. So I decide to make a political point here today. And I will uh, address this uh, of uh, agenda points that have been highlighted by uh, Joel. And unfortunately, I won't be focusing on Anna many questions, and I apologize for that. So I may come up with a handful of cliches embedded in outrage and anger, the same feelings that assault me every morning when I read the news or after I exchange views with friends. But I do know this is exactly what populism is experts in at doing, namely generating and spreading moral indignation. So it is in such moments that I then make an effort to regain control and rid myself of this promiscuous narrative, the kind of syndrome pointed out by Molyneux and Osborne in their recent paper on populism, a promiscuous narrative that contaminates the entire political spectrum, for populism takes no sides and plays no favorites. If we are to be united by fear and anxiety, then this will most certainly prove a self-defeating course. But there is indeed a backlash out there and it scares me. It should have, as in the past, energized my passion and engagement to not only resist, but to take advantage of the certain historical conjuncture and push for constructive change. But something is missing this time. The confidence and enthusiasm I felt in previous contexts is now sorely lacking. Why is that so? Because what we use it to call the left has shrunk and practically evaporated. This is why I would say that the issue which now needs addressing at this conference is of a dual nature. Not only the rise of the far right political wing, but the demise of the left. I would have therefore given today's session a slightly different title. We are talking about the revival of populism, the rise of the far right political wing. That's true. But to my mind, we are not sufficiently emphasizing the demise of the left and the role it has played not only in its own demise, but in paving the way to the edge of the cliff. As a Brazilian, I can tell you frankly that we are now standing on the edge of that cliff. My take is that these phenomena are intertwined, the rise of the far right and the end of the left as we knew it, and must therefore be addressed as two sides of the same coin. By the same token, one should not blame the reemergence of populism solely on a revitalization of the extreme right wing. We may address populism either as a conceptual tool or as a, or as a political and social phenomenon. This is the focus of today's seminar. We can also address populism as a structural or a conjunctural phenomenon. As a consequence, one must acknowledge that there exist varieties of populism and that Latin America may serve an example in this respect. For populism in Latin America, as I understand it, is both structurally and conjuncturally determined, being fueled by recurrent crises of all sorts. As is known, the rhetoric of crisis is intrinsic and constitutive of populism. Let's then keep in mind that the repertoire of populism is rather broad. This is not only a mark of the radical right. Populism has been a major feature of Latin American politics and economic development ever since the 40s. Peron in Argentina, Vargas in Brazil, Aya de la Torre in Peru, Velasco's Ibama, Ibarra in Ecuador, Cárdenas in Mexico, or Gaitán in Colombia. To cite those leaders who held office during the first wave of import substitution, that period when state interventions were key in promoting capitalist relations through industrialization. Protectionism, not only to boost national sectors, but also in protecting, protecting the people from the elites, and some attempts to develop social insurance as a way to conform a new proletariat were in the manual. 
Most of these leaders pursued nationalist policy, and some of them also pursued limited redistributive social policies, incorporating into the nation those segments of the population which had, been, which had previously been excluded from it, moving from heterodox to liberal policies according to the context, governing according to democratic principles, while most often, let's not forget it, also applying authoritarian rules and cracking down on former allies that could not be co-opted. All of these leaders were fighting the oligarchies while creating new coalitions that produced new oligarchies and not more homogeneous and egalitarian societies. Latin America remains still marked by structural heterogeneity, both productive and social. Despite their very real difference, these populist platforms pursued in the various Latin American countries were marked by a dynamic of popular inclusion while benefiting from massive popular support, which was engendered by a new urban working class industrial, in which in turn was swiftly and steadily co-opted by the political leaders, all of which was accompanied by the rise of new elites. This kind of populism, which goes by the phrase classic populism, associated with the modernization of Latin American societies, was finally repressed in Latin America by a series of military coups. Then a new wave of populism reemerged during the redemocratization process in the late 80s and 90s. Menin in Argentina, Collor in Brazil, Fujimori in Peru, are all illustrative of a new wave of clientelism and patronage that was openly neoliberal in which the literature has thus dubbed neoliberal neopopulism. But we have been through a third wave of populism. This came in the wake of the pink tide and was marked by a political shift in the populist tradition through the rise of a radical populism committed to refounding the nation and reinventing 21st century socialism. Chavez, Morales, Correa were swept to power by the excluded masses, namely the urban poor and lower classes, destitute peasants, as well as the impoverished and repressed indigenous communities, those who continue to be gen the genuine outsiders in our societies, though now integrated in market relations. The true people were once more mobilized against the elites and the oligarchies. New pioneering constitutions were drafted, as in the case of Ecuador and Bolivia. They recognized the plurality of political nations while adopting concepts such as sumac kozai, which means living well or buen vivir, and thus acknowledging the diverse spectrum of human ways of life. Nature become a subject with rights, a move all the more significant in a place with a century-long tradition of extractivism as the key to an international insertion rooted in the commodification of nature and expropriation from indigenous peoples and the masses of the never represented. Extractivism days seemed numbered. Chavez, Morales, and Correa were acclaimed as post-neoliberal governments, despite the fact that the left was unable to so much as explain the precise content of post-neoliberal policymaking. And what exactly happened uh, to Latin America during the pink tide? For most leftist and center-left government, including Brazil and Argentina, there was a shift to reprimarization of the economy, as pointed out yesterday by Juan in his presentation, marking a return to extractivism rather than deploying more audacious development strategies that would take time to mature, but which would have finally fueled that structural shift which you have been expecting for decades. But this government succumbed to populism and their desire to remain in power, for the sake of the people, of course. The most immediate consequence was that natural resources, such a precious and outstanding differential, have been commodified in a disgraceful and irresponsible fashion. In agriculture, as well in large-scale mining projects, extractivism has stolen the scene and made the development model a corollary of violence blood and the denial of the most fundamental rights of those populations traditionally marginalized by growth. Extractivism went a step beyond dominating the agriculture and animal husbandry sector. The spread of genetically modified organisms in Argentina and Brazil helped to wipe out native species. The environmental costs are extraordinarily high 
and may not be reversible. Indigenous and peasant uh, resistance to extractivism, meanwhile, has resulted in violent criminalization and numerous deaths. The death toll of environmental activists and nature defenders has never been so high in Latin America. It's the highest worldwide. We are back to colonial times marked by violence, murders, incarceration, and expropriation. Both left and right fell silent when it came to the sort of development, and the brutal violence is wrought as if there were all the prices to pay in the search for progress. Similar signs met the alliance between democratic elected left-wing leaders, Latin America rentier elites, major mining and agribusiness multinationals. The return to extractivism brought an even greater concentration of power and wealth, feeding the growing dilution of environmental regulations and the savage repression of indigenous peasant environmentally movements. It also strengthened the most conservative groups in parliament, as is the case of Brazil. The Brazilian agribusiness, for instance, is a leading force within any current political coalition. The Brazilian agribusiness, for, uh, is, uh, yeah, they are now more than powerful than 15 years ago because they spread their influence for having been chosen as the Brazilian global players to compete in international markets. They were granted billions in subsidies, special credit lines, and tax waivers. Meanwhile, states continue to avoid prior consultation with respect to the use of land as established by law in many countries. In the absence of official mechanisms of consultation, people establish autonomous ones which are denied by the states and severely repressive. Latin America remains not only the most unequal region in the world, but also the most violent. And the commodities consensus, as coined by Maristela Svampa, gets stronger every day. Let me go to you, Carlos de la Torre's view. He's a political scientist that had to leave Ecuador because, of course, he was... Um, harassed by Correa for being critical to Correa's government. Now he's professor in the United States. In Venezuela and Ecuador, new populist caudillos of the 21st century are concentrating power in their own hands and are undermining both the separation of powers as well as the institutional space that guarantees civil society's autonomy from the state. If under neoliberalism, the mass market penetrated and weakened a fragile civil society, under 21st century socialism, the state's attempt to control or co-opt social movements is the mark. In Venezuela and Ecuador, and to a lesser extent in Bolivia, citizens' rights to form independent political associations or organizations to express themselves without fear of reprisal are being undermined and attacked at the same time uh, the press and the media freedom are being curtailed. Do you think that this has nothing to do with the economic model put in place by recent leftist and center leftist American governments and their priorities with regard to social policies? The backlash we have experienced, and which is far from being reversed, calls into question those choices and shortcomings which have been characterized, which have characterized the trajectory of leftist and democratic parties since the rise of neoliberalism. It's true that throughout the 20th century, we witnessed several processes entailing a renewal and the recomposition of the left. But after the fall of the Berlin Wall, this, this, the way the left, that leftist and democratic parties embraced neoliberalism and ignored the fact that people's lives were rapidly and profoundly deteriorating and that suffering was spreading, this was a clear indication that the left had already succumbed and was declining to represent our political, social, and economic aspirations. Looking at my both countries, France and Brazil, makes me realize that the laws still to come are difficult to measure and evaluate, not to mention those losses that have already been incurred. But why not mention a few of them? This includes, in the first instance, the loss of hope, or any fating change. In the second instance, there is the loss of dignity and security, without which any prosperity worthy of the name is meaningless. In the race to the bottom, it would seem that the bottom is being lowered on a daily basis and with no end in sight. So just how are we to forestall this disaster and redress the situation? Uh, being on the left as opposed to the right was to take a clear position. You had a strict ideological divide with political identities that were relatively well defined. The far left existed back then and gathered those who thought that revolution was not only feasible but necessary in carrying out the essential structural shifts to curtail capitalism. Whereas the far right seemed to have been phased out since the age of World War II, 
thus thanks to a long period of sustainable economic growth coupled with increasing democracy and new patterns of redistribution. It goes without saying that welfare regimes and social protection schemes play the fundamental role in fueling our positive expectations, as recalled by John Abramate when he states that Keynesianism and the robust welfare state created a historical climate that was unfavorable for right-wing populist movements in Europe and in the United States. This movement seems now, if not completely gone, at least interrupted. Public provision is at stake and is being replaced by various for-profit schemes due to the prevalence since the late 70s of neoliberal economic thought, globalization, and the destruction of public finance by a certain type of macroeconomic policy that is marked by fiscal authority and subsumed by the logic of interest-bearing capital. Conditionality controls residual schemes tend to prevail despite the fact that some welfare dimensions have expanded in many countries, notably these relating to poverty alleviation in the developing world. The last decade has proven to be a great time to monetize the poor and drag them into the market, including financial markets. And this financial inclusion has been celebrated by the left as a signal of democratization. The idea welfare state model is no longer needed, not only because the current regime of accumulation increasingly dominated by finance is taking over the state and causing the public sphere to collapse, but also due to the emergence of limited forms of democracy and deepening social fragmentation. This social fragmentation is reframing subjective subjectivities in the midst of a process of class restructuring, and this transition is difficult to apprehend. It's no accident that people are now thinking in terms of financial resources as a way of coping with risk, since welfare regimes appear to be less effective in providing security. It's true that both finance and social protection schemes are organized under the banner of risk, but the very notion of risk has changed in the meantime, acquiring profoundly different meanings. Paradoxically and simultaneously, risk is now being systematically manufactured by the financial sector, financial institutions, and their actors. And this engenders a distrust of institutions. Distrust and suspicions are the watchwords of our times. I'm going to move. <laughs> So uh, I think that the, the big problem we have now is uh, the idea that uh, uh, we have this distorting political representation and uh, supposedly we're moving towards uh, different uh, forms of political action. And uh, maybe those political forms are emerging. Uh, I think all uh, is hopefully not lost. A very interesting and su successful experiment is presently, presently taking place in Portugal with a left-wing coalition running the government under the leadership of the, of the Portuguese Communist Party is running. In a word, the coalition is contesting the current power hegemony in these in this times of scarce progressive alternatives. But as we know, one swallow does not a summer make. Perhaps starting a process of reckoning with prior mistakes might unleash a new trend to create and unite a truly progressive coalition, including and strengthening, again, the middle class. Unfortunately, this is not what's going on in Brazil for now. Self-critique is not in the agenda. When the Workers' Party was in office, criticism was condemned because it could destabilize the government after two decades of attempts to take power. Some of us who were severe critics have been literally demonized. And of course, as populist governments often do, anti-intellectualism anti was there to devalue complexity. Now, in the midst of a disaster, this is not either the right time for a long overdue reflection of the paths taken, because with a non-elect right-wing government in place, the left cannot weaken its political capital by recognizing missteps and wrongdoings. It seems that to acknowledge mistake, flaws, and omission never comes this time. This is a main characteristic of the Latin American left and very likely of the left in general. Venezuela is just the most dramatic, desperate, and poignant evidence on this. Before wrapping out, let me briefly come back to the case of Brazil. In 2013, exactly four years ago, protests filled the country's major urban hubs, where at the very beginning, hundreds of thousands of people called for quality public services, free healthcare and education, and subsidized efficient public transportation.
Dilma's administration was unable to correctly translate the desires and expectations of a population that seemed to be out of place, working off the wrong script. It was as if the marchers were somehow resisting a new habitus, like put by Bourdieu, understood as adaptation and adjustment to the real world and to a new or revised social contract, ultimately, ultimately resisting the material, everyday increasing banalized practice of what Ben Fine refers to as the material culture of financialization. The recent cycle of growth in Brazil saw effective the adoption of an array of policies and regulations that rather than resuscitate and shoring up the existing social protection system, it was plunged deeper into the logic of the market and broaden commodification also via the financialization and collateralization of social policy. Creditors' legal rights would be expanded and strengthened via the efficient intervention of the developmentalist state. The creation of consigned credit at the end of Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva's first term in office, even before the launch of Bolsa Família, is a perfect example of how financial neoliberalism took on an ever great prominence and depth, corroding the foundation of the social protection system in order to create another at its own image. It's indeniable that redistribution was never made a priority under the tenure of the Workers' Party. It was not just that there was no room for a third of courageous tax reforms that might have tackled the regressivity of the prevailing system. Rather, tax policy and tax regulation was honed to serve the logic of financialization through an active thrust towards more exemptions and tax credits in favor of business and rich households, concentrate wealth and power against the grain of the collective interest. What is interesting is that the narrative no, not long ago was that Brazil had achieved a win-win coalition. What a difference. Everybody was benefiting from this new cycle of economic growth under the Workers' Party, especially the financial sector and the wealthiest. The populist vertical opposition of the people versus the elite was non-existent. The rhetoric of everyone wins fit into the rhetoric of conciliation, flirting with the foundational myth of Brazil as a cordial nation. The Workers' Party, once in power, okay, I'm gonna finish in two minutes. <laughs> believed it possible to, be re to refound the nation by creating new social identities, once forged not on bonds of collective uh, belonging, but rather on having credit cards, personal bank accounts, and the soul. But now the recent economic model, but now that the recent economic model proved to have failed and the backlash in Brazil goes well beyond the most pessimist expectations, the elites are to be blamed. Lula has radically changed his discourse and now points to the elites as the, one, the ones responsible for the dramatic downward trend. The cause of all our problems is that the elites and the oligarchies did not tolerate the people occupying new social positions. Were they really moving up in the social ladder by consuming and running debts? The fact that we, the people, became more visible, though continuously marginalized and segregated, was this the real problem or the lack of massive investment so as to provide a more egalitarian access to well-being through public provision? Corner, the Workers' Party, and Lula in particular, is engendering a new narrative that is very likely to foster a new trend of leftist populism in my country and maybe also in the region. I think this is a great time to broaden our analysis and examine how these multiple forms of populism may condemn our common future. My feeling is that leftist populism of many sorts will be competing with right-wing populists. Our role as progressive intellectuals, as highlighted by Anna Carolina in his introductory note, is to contribute to clarify what is at stake and propose a new way forward. Thank you, sorry for being long. Can you hear me? We can. First, the good news. Good news is, first, I'm delighted to be here. And secondly, I am happy to do all I can to support the EPOG project in any reasonable way possible. The bad news is that um, I was told I should speak for 15 minutes. Uh, there would be a round table with three people and uh, then I looked at the program and it was two people for two hours so in a panic last night 
I doubled my talk, <laughs> and then this morning I find I've got to Harvard again, and fortunately mm. my extra came at the beginning, so I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Exactly. There's more bad news, which is I have no idea why I was asked to talk on this topic. It's outside my us. expertise. Yeah, exactly. Um, if we accept disciplinary boundaries, this is about political science as opposed to political economy. And so given the shortage of time, I adopted those old strategies of change the question, and then that is change the topic, and talk about what I do know rather than what I was supposed to talk about, and then put forward such grand postures that no one can even understand me, let alone disagree. So please excuse what comes next. So the question I'm going to ask is, what is the relationship? I'm not convinced. I say, let me begin by questioning the question. I'm not sure that there has been a rise of the radical right. Um, Latin America might suggest otherwise, although its record and presence is increasingly tarnished, as, as has been pointed out. Uh, so the question is more, what is the relationship between economic developments and political developments. And that's what I want to talk about uh, in terms of politics itself and but also how political science has, and indeed to some extent economists, have responded to this issue. Traditionally, politi political science has sought very simple mechanical solutions to these questions. Um, that is, what is the rise of political movements and political outment, out, but, but it's also the case that the rise of political movements and political outcomes are intimately related to theories of the state and civil society. And these tend to be much more complex and multiple and multiple faceted. The main exception to this question, although there's an exception to this exception in a minute, has been mainstream economics. Uh, which has a facile theory of the state, or two facile theories of the state. One is that it's a benign dictator putting market imperfections correct, and the other is that it's uh, full of corruption and villainy and should be reduced to a minimum. Marxism clearly has to parody an honorable record in which the state is seen as an instrument of capitalist rule, which the working class can oppose to a greater or a lesser extent, but, uh, unfortunately, the working class is subject to false consciousness, and although it's revolutionary by nature, something gets in the way of its exercising that revolutionary nature. It might be economism, vulgar self-interest, for example, or it might be ideologically hoodwinked. And so we need something to uh, pull the wool off the eyes of the working class a revolutionary vanguard party or whatever. Now, in my view, this does not work. Uh, I've made that fairly clear. Because even the existence of the radical right, let alone its rise, is something that cannot be explained by this. Uh, we positive, where a working class, at least in parts, positively adopts what would appear to be, by this classical analysis, the exact opposite of its own class interests. So I don't think we're going to get much uh, mileage out of this. The slightly different approach is to try and read off politics or the ideology from as many variables in common as can be put together. Politics flows from the presence of trade unionism, the composition of interest, of industry, the levels of unemployment, ethnic diversity, and so on. So here's where I got my first addition uh, to my talk. Uh, by chance, yesterday, I downloaded the very latest paper by Danny Roderick, which, guess what it was on? Uh, the rise of populism. And uh, I found myself, at least temporarily, in the embarrassing position of agreeing with him. So, but not to worry, I soon got away from that. <laughs> and what he argues is that populism takes two forms, left and right, and globalization produces one or the other, depending upon the circumstances. How does he show this? Well, he starts with the stolper samuelson trade theory, believe it or not. And we all know from trade theory that there can be distributional losses to certain sections of the population, particularly the unskilled and so on. And that shifts populism to the left in the absence of migration. 
and in the presence of migration, it shifts it to the right. So here we have a perfect explanation of the rise of either left-wing or right-wing populism, with politics reduced to three sections of the population. There's an elite, there's a majority, and then there's a minority. And does the majority go with the elite, or does it go with the minority? It depends whether there's migration or not. And, well, what about when you get both? Well, US has both. It's got Sanders and Trump because it's got both migration and it's got... Jim gets an idea. Okay, uh, interestingly, throughout the work, perhaps I ought to have done a search, but I didn't, I uh, didn't have time, there's no mention of unemployment. Uh, he does include finance, but uh, can't really give a role for finance um, because there's no one for people to obviously blame when it comes to finance. It's too sort of distant in some way, which I think is uh, kind of correct for reasons which will, will come up. But that has not always been correct. If we think about the 30s, if we think about for two days, finance was in trouble uh, politically and ideologically and for a little bit longer, but not. But there is an issue of what is the nature of contemporary capitalism, which has so allowed finance to do what it has done but without it being the very, very closely uh, 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 close subject of, 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 um, of discontent. How am I doing? Yeah, I'm right, five minutes, okay, I'm doing well, actually. Uh, then on my second edition, uh, which is a bit of an indulgence, because some of you may know that uh, for the last 20 years, I've been an obsessive critic of something called social capital. And that seeks to explain political participation and more or less everything else as well by reference to this notion of social capital. By the way, there is a history of social capital which is hidden. And because in it really the first user of social capital was in the US by James Buchanan, a Nobel Prize winner for economics, neoliberal member of Mont Pelerin, um, and uh, proponent of public choice theory. The choice of going to war or peace is the same as the choice between an apple and a pear. And what he did was to bemoan the decline of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, WASP America, in the 1960s with the rise of civil rights, anti-war movement, and so on. So he had a very, very clear idea about what the decline of politics and social capital was in the US. The baton on social capital was then taken up by the rational choice sociologist from Chicago, James Coleman, who was a close collaborator with, yes, Gary Becker, ran a joint seminar on how to explain the entire world by optimizing individuals and giving utility functions. And then the, the, uh, the baton was taken up by Rod Robert Putnam, very, very famous for social capital in the 1990s. He was the most cited author across the social sciences. Um, he was actually inspired by Italy, by this very region where we sit now. And his argument was, why did the North develop and not the South of Italy? And he said, social capital was laid down in the North of Italy in the 12th century. And none of it had changed in the next 700 years of history. And that was why the North developed and the South didn't. But interestingly, his data for a civil associationalism came from 1980. By 1985, five years as opposed to 700, actually the South had caught up in civil associations with the North, but obviously had not caught up in development. What Putnam did then was to go to, you'll see where I'm going with this soon. You might be thinking, what's this got to do? I said, I just taught what I know about Norfolk, so. He went, but then went back to America, and it's the decline in social capital in America, which is the problem in his classic book called Bowling Alone, in which he referred to bow, the decline of bowling clubs as the reason why America was in decline, as well as watching TV. Um, I like to point to two big things about bowling clubs. Uh, one is that the Oklahoma bombings were organized through a bowling club, and you only have to watch the film Big, The Big Lebowski, right, to, does everyone know Big Lebowski? Yeah, right, to know something about bowling clubs and their contribution to civil society. Um, 
in his latest work, in his latest work, Putnam has talked about ethnic diversity, and he sees ethnic diversity itself as something which militates against social capital, because people from different places don't trust one another. We know this, so they won't associate with one another. And so that also leads to, to decline. And of course, economists love the notion of ethnic diversity because they can measure it, and then they can put it in a regression, and they can use it to explain things. Uh, interestingly, if Roderick had used ethnic diversity, then he might have had a different story for Latin America, but no, he uses migration instead because that uh, gives him the results he wants. But the telling point about Putnam, and really the reason for this long digression, is that he takes his inspiration not just from social capital and from the neoliberals, Coleman and unknowingly Buchanan, but from de, 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 de Tocqueville, the French a uh, political scientist who visited an American and praised it for its political associationalism. But what uh, Putnam completely overlooks is that de Tocqueville put forward two explanations. One was the associationalism and the lack of, of distinct and, and overt class distinctions. And the other one was inequality. De Tocqueville made a huge uh, um, point about the egalitarianism of American society in the 19th century. And of course, over the period when Putnam is bemoaning the decline of bowling clubs and watching and the watching of television, we've had the dramatic reversal in levels of inequality in the United States. And perhaps that's where we ought to look for, for decline. In addition, across the entire social capital literature, there are three in particular, there are many others, there are three notable absences. One is the trade union, trade unions, which are possibly the single most important source of social capital. The second is the absence of the state, although the country with the most social capital is Sweden, and that's not surprising given the role played by the state in promoting activities. And the last thing is the global, the global. I mean, the single most important social capitalist and not bowling clubs, but those 450 global corporations that run the world. Across all the literature on social capital, I've probably read two or 3,000 contributions. I can only think of one which talks about the global elite, and it was about how actually all international law is pretty much written by the United States. The problem is, more generally then, there is no end of variables to add, and relations are not liable to remain stable over time between those variables and uh, uh, political formations and content. The rise of Corbyn, for example, reflects the heavy involvement of youth, previously thought to be apathetic, although that's possibly oxymoronic because that was an active apathy, given the, oh dear, I'm halfway, uh, given the uh, <laughs> limited political choices available. On the other hand, the rise of the racist right across Eastern Europe is also driven by a membership and a leadership by those under the age of 30. This signals two things, that the content of politics uh, must be situated contextually. With the rise of the right or not in one place as opposed to another is not liable to be subject to general examination although there are general conducive conditions um, uh, that can be readily identified. Unemployment, recession, austerity, migration, nationalism, ethnic divisions and conflicts, although these do not guarantee the rise of the right. Again, to warm to the theme that this issue is not purely about the rise of the radical right, it is I'm old enough to have witnessed the rise of the so-called authoritarianism associated with Mrs. Thatcher, itself accompanied by Reaganism. Here the task was set of explaining the rise of the radical right in the past. So this is not something that's supposed to be new. The question's uh, not new. And nor should we, of course, set aside the rise of fascism and how that influenced social science in seeking to explain how this could happen in a capitalism in the interwar period. I want to be more constructive by addressing then the politics of neoliberalism, and we've had some discussion of this already, but what is neoliberalism? And that's been variously understood 
Uh, but for me, the fundamental aspects, two fundamental aspects of neoliberalism are first, that it is a stage of capitalism, and secondly, it is a stage of capitalism that is underpinned by financialization. Although there are varieties of ways of understanding both neoliberalism and financialization. And I would define a stage, though, as how economic and social restructuring takes place. And really, what's defining neoliberalism is the extent to which finance intervenes so much, both directly and indirectly, in our economic and social restructuring, giving way, as I was mentioned earlier, to what I've called the material culture of our everyday lives. Directly, we've had three times the increase in financial assets over the last 30 years than GDP. Directly, we have privatizations, which then become the basis on which there can be further uh, financialization. Indirectly, we have market forms, user charges, we have influence over our economic policies, and we have the incorporation of a market logic into every area of our lives. Um, what neoliberalism has also done in the political sphere, some people call it rolling back, I think that's wrong, uh, it's more a hollowing out, is to change the nature of the way in which politics is conducted and the way in which politics, uh, sorry, policy is made. And that I think has involved first a hollowing out of those influences associated with social compacting and then the rolling out of an entirely different way of implementing policy. This, for example, involves the loss of sovereignty, as we've seen in Greece and Italy in some respects. Another area which is extremely important is the revolving doors between business, politics, consultancy, and the media. So there's been a profound, and we've seen this here, profound transformation in how, where, and by whom policy is made, um, including major capitalists becoming presidents in one country after another. And it's, well, actually, was in talking about privatization, what I was saying just last week is it's very important to understand the nature of Mrs. Thatcher's privatization program, which was based on this motivation. Who voted against me? We will get rid of them. Who was it? Trade unionists. People who worked in nationalized industries. People who lived in social housing. Uh, civil servants people living in great urban centers. So actually Mrs. Thatcher abolished the, city, the local government for its four major cities. So we can see very, very clearly the transformation in the nature of the way in which policy is made and how politics is conducted with the declining presence of progressive organizations and policymakers, making it difficult for alternative policies to emerge, let alone to be adopted, and let alone to be succeeded. I'm almost there. Is that okay? No, it's okay. Uh, okay. In addition, I think we've got to recognize that this all takes place in a situation, oh, there was, an, there was uh, two other promises that were made. Uh, one was shareholder democracy, and we all know that's, that's been fucked, uh, with the rising inequalities in income and wealth. The other one came from Harold Wilson in 1963, which was we were gonna have the white heat of technology. And this leads me to, again, the context in which we must understand the current politics is, I believe, that, sorry, I'm gonna use the F word again, capitalists have entirely fucked it up. I mean, they really have. Go to, go to any capitalist and say, what do you want? Tell me what you want. And they can, anything you look at, they've had it, right? Think about it. As I've already mentioned, there has been the most, I think this is the most important thing, an extraordinary stream of new technologies which ought to have boosted tech, the capacity to deliver high growth, increases in quality of life, etc., etc. We can put, we can put satellites or whatever, spacecraft on Mars to see if there's water or not, but we can't deliver it to the people on Earth, even though just the rescue of AID, the AIG, the major insurance company in the US, was enough, involved enough money to provide water and sewage to every third world city in the world. You know, this is something about the priorities of what capitalism can but does not achieve. Capitalists have had the decline in the strength, the organization, the presence of trade unions and liberation movements. Okay, so we've 
knocked away all that opposition. They've won the Cold War. Okay, that one's done. They've adopted neoliberalism. That's won. You've had huge, massive increases in the labor force through women's female, female labor market participation and the uh, entry of China, you know, an extra billion workers helps capitalism a fair bit, don't you think? Uh, so, as it were, what do they want? You know, what do they want to succeed? Uh, what, what could they possibly want? And yet, and we all know why this has happened, is that financialization has meant that all of these golden opportunities have gone into what has primarily been a huge speculative and unchallenged jamboree. But what I want to do now, though, is say something about how this affects uh, politics. And the first thing to say is this financialization, could go into great detail, there's no time for that, has had uneven incidents itself. Obviously, it's very prominent in the UK and the US, but it has different uh, levels and different forms elsewhere in the world. As well as being uneven in its incidents, it's also uneven in its impact whether it be in housing markets or share markets or investment or whatever. And so uh, this leads me to the conclusion. There's, there's one thing. You're only, it's only two things, two words. So if, that you have, actually, it's only one letter and one word. You can go away with which is my talk. And that is, this leads to what I call V cubed. And V stands for variegated, vulnerability, and volatilities. What this financialization has done is to lead to variegated vulnerabilities and volatilities across almost every area of economic and social and political life. But how we understand that, how we receive that politically, as say what was referred to as the material culture, is very, very weird. In the case of water in Britain, for example, you turn on the tap, the water flows out. Do, who knows when they do that? But 30% of the revenue taken in user charges goes in dividends, interest payments, into a pyramid of companies, internationally organized companies, into the Cayman Islands. No one. Who knows about the boiler rooms when their mortgage defaults? No one. So what we can see is the way in which the economy works, the way in which it creates this V cubed, is very, very indirectly received by those who, whether it's in housing, pensions, water, employment, is very, very uh, distant in the way in which it can and is understood, in which the media plays an incredibly important role as well. And so this is why the, the, the ways in which dissent takes place and the forms in which dissent takes place are so variegated as well. And not surprisingly, there's this huge variegation in the narrow political environment as well, with Brexit, with Corbyn, uh, for example, the need for coalitions, the, the decline of parties, PASOK, it's go just gone uh, in no time at all, uh, as well as, hmm? it's not true? So it's hardly surprising then that we have this extraordinarily variegation in politics itself with the rise of the need for coalitions and so on, my last sentence. So, so I do think it's correct to see that there is a rise of the right. Uh, to, you need to situate it in terms of what I've called the V cubed, vari variegated vulnerabilities and volatility. And that rise of the right is inevitable. I don't think we can stop it, it's inevitable. Um, it's as inevitable as uh, part of working class consciousness and culture as are other causes, such as unemployment and so on. But what is not inevitable is its he hegemony. Uh, uh, in, although populism is, as I think we've sort of seen already, the default political position par excellence within neoliberalism. But I would also argue that the rise of quote unquote, the radical left is equally certain and inevitable. And the challenge for us is to engage in a battle of position uh, as best we can. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much to all. Uh, <laughs> for, for the presentation and now we're going to take <laughs>
uh, a couple of questions. Um, so we're going to take three or four questions and we'll make a rounder of answers and then let's start. Hi, I'm Facundo, and well, I, I want to um, to bring a comment mainly for the presentation by Lena. Um, I totally agree with the, your characterization of of the economic features of of the models by Kirchner and Lula, but I wanted to challenge this underlying idea in your speech, according to which. Populi, populism, left populism is kind of the same as right populism. I mean, you're not the only one arguing that. We had in, in Brazil some marginal left-wing parties uh, claiming that there was not a coup d'etat, but just was a struggle between elites. And in Argentina, we had also intellectuals and marginal left-wing parties saying the, the same, that Kirchner and Macri are both expression of capitalist uh, groups. Uh, and I think it is important to point out the, the marginal incidence that these left-wing parties and intellectual have in the population, because when we look what the working class is voting, we are seeing that in October in Argentina, Mostly 30% of the people we vote for Christina Kirchner and maybe 80% of, of, of people we vote for Peronist parties. And when we when see Brazilian case, we see that Lula is the only one that, that is like a, a possible, a potential uh, candidate to, to take office uh, next year. And I think that if we tell these people uh, that Lula is the same than Temer and Kirchner is the same than Macri, uh, we cannot dialogue with them. Like they, they, they saw an improvement in their living conditions, in their working conditions in the last 10 years. They actually want uh, more improvements. And if the first thing we tell them is that, well, what happened uh, uh, last 10 years, last decade was just uh, an illusion. and. Uh, is, is more or less the same that we, we are having now, they will just not listen to you anymore. And then one, one another important point is about the characterization of Bolivia and Venezuela. When you talk about these countries, you talk about the loose of, of social rights, but you didn't mention that those governments are democratically elected that, for instance, Evo Morales is the first indigenous uh, president in a country ruled by white people in the whole history, that Evo Morales uh, got to be famous in the war uh, for the water, which was a war uh, against the privatization of water, and that the Bolivian state turned into a multinational, uh, plurinational state, uh, uh, taking into account the national identities of, of of indigenous people. And you didn't mention that uh, the Venezuela, go uh, the government of Venezuela or, the, or Chavism has won more than 10 elections and has only lost two midterm elections and has always accepted the results while the right wing never accepted the results of the elections when they lose, but obviously they accept them when when they win, yeah? So I, 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 I I th and also, well, just to point out that, like, you kind of, sorry, but you kind of repeated, like, like the media analysis of Venezuela, where they talk about the 80 people that died in the last year, but they don't mention that 50 people are uh, Chavez activists. We have seen uh, right-wing movements backed by the U.S. burning and, uh, and, and Chavez activists in the street. We had two weeks ago uh, a, a military uh, throwing bombs from an helicopter uh, to public buildings. Um, and well, if you, if, if you say that, that Venezuela is an authoritarian government which is in a crisis, and I accept that it's in a crisis and it's in a civil war, we, we, I don't know, we could say that Allende was wrong in the 73 when they called the people to resist against the coup d'etat because this was authoritarian and this was violent. But well, what will happen in Venezuela if we have a coup d'etat now? We, we will have like the same that we had in, under uh, Pinochet coup d'etat because 
the, the right wing movements in Venezuela don't want democracy. And well, this is again for me a problem because it's not the same left wing populism or progressive populism or neo developmentist, how, however we want to call these uh, political movements. They are not the same as, as, as right wing and far uh, right populist uh, movements. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, uh, Shoel. Uh, I like, uh, we hear, heard a lot today about different terms, like technical terms, right? Dividends. Hello? Yeah. OK, it's working. So dividends, buybacks, neoliberalism, then financialization, and a lot of different things. But I'm really surprised that none of the speakers talked about religion. Where do we place religion in this, you know? It's a casual pie. I agree that there are different causes. There is no one cause. And it would be really difficult to accept, like, say that, okay, only financialization is a cause. And also the nature of right is not same everywhere. It's uh, like if we go to different uh, places around the globe, it's totally different. It's not the same in India. We are seeing a new type of right in India, which we, like, it was unseen before. So where do you place religion in that? Okay, or isn't the nature of democracy itself changing now, like what we had before? Because people are choosing, right? So majority is choosing, majority is making the decision. Okay, so what can you say about that? Thank you. Thanks, um, I enjoyed actually all four. I think yours was also, your introduction was also a presentation. Uh, all four presentations very much. Um, <clears throat> I was just, I mean, I just have a, a sideway comment, which is um, I, I kind of feel that we, we need to have a class analysis of, of populism. And that class analysis needs to understand how transformations in the world economy in the last 40 years have affected uh, the potential for, for, for mobilization and, and for a left project but also how a lot of this has been shaped by a very clear class analysis coming from the neoliberals themselves. I mean, Ben, you've alluded to how Thatcher had sort of understood the kinds of enemies she had, but that really reminded me of how in the early 1990s, in the face of much criticism uh, of the Washington Consensus, um, the Washington institutions and the Inter-American Development Bank developed a very clear analysis of the groups that stood to lose from liberalization policies. They had very, very interesting um, sort of like proto-political science coming from neoclassical economists saying, with our reforms, trade unions and the public sector tend to lose out, domestic import producing capitalists tend to lose out, etc., etc. And they basically came up with this very interesting idea before the post-Washington consensus to say, the best way to make these reforms work, these neoliberal reforms, is shock therapy. Just do them all in one go and cuts the grass under the feet of potential resistance. And they had very clearly identified who was going to lose out from this. So, so what, my question or my comment is simply, today, what are the forces that are most losing um, from, from the reforms and that could be mobilized in a way that's different from some of the criticism, I think, which is understandable that you've expressed, Lena, but I also understand the question that was asked just now, which is obviously the left isn't perfect um, and we need to build on something. And, and what do we think we can build on and, and not build on? You know? and, and I think uh, we're not going out of academic discussions to refound progressive politics based on what we think is the right way. And I think that's why uh, a class analysis that looks at these transformations is so important. Uh, it's very clear to me that successful right-wing strategies are based on very pragmatic and efficient class analysis that have worked very well so far. So can't we have a response to that? So uh, it's, a, it's a question about financialization, so it's probably more directly connected to your presentation, Joel. And you based part of your argument on uh, Bill Lazenik's analysis, and basically is uh, arguing for, last, for the last 20 years that uh, US non-financial companies are serving the interest of shareholders and to the detriment of um, other stakeholders, but more importantly to the detriment of long-term investment research and development. Uh, 
So, and US uh, non-financial companies do so, uh, according to uh, Lazonic, probably more than uh, any other companies uh, in the world. So it's really the, the land of uh, financialization, the kingdom of financialization. Um, so in a sense, it's looked like a, a, a collective suicide. But at the same time, uh, it's kind of a paradox. The, I think we can argue that the US economy has been quite successful over the last 20 years in terms of growth, uh, or also in terms of uh, um, the development of, uh, of uh, the uh, new technology industry with very s big successful companies. So it's, it's a very hard question, but uh, how can we reconcile those two uh, uh, approaches or uh, elements? Do you have a tentative explanation for that, for this paradox? Make a quick comment before passing the, the word, just to say that our intention here is like uh, we we invited them, and I saw that they were really worried. Like, why why I was invited to talk about the far right? I don't know anything about populism, but this is what we wanted. We 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 are young economists, and we read about the explanations of populism in the newspapers uh, related to neoliberalism, and we felt that there is more going on than, than we read usually, and uh, you guys are, are really good in neoliberalism, globalization, and we wanted to hear from economists uh, and not fr only from uh, political scientists, uh, but so, and I'm really happy with what we hear now, uh, we, we just heard, but at the same time, we have to have responsibility. I'm fully aware of that, of what we talk. So I think, like I, I tried to highlight in my short presentation, I didn't have time to talk about that. But of course, we have many, many different types of populism. And I could include in the, uh, Hugo Chavez and Bernie Sanders, etc., the problems in religion in India. And, and it's, uh, they are so different that we cannot tackle anything in 25 minutes. And I wouldn't ask for our speakers to talk about something that is so far, that is so different from what we, we usually talk. But of course, this is an issue. And um, so just to make the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Him first. No, you, you go start. First. You start first. No. You won't have time to I talk. Start. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I won't be too long. <laughs> OK. Um, I'll leave Lena to talk about the first question. Although in my own presentation, I did try to make clear that uh, it is crucial to talk about populism or indeed the rise of the right or the left in terms of its form, content and causes uh, in a very, very contextual if grounded in the conditions of, what do I call it when I've really got a lot of time? the neoliberalized, financialized, material culture of everyday life. That's, that's what we have to address when we're trying to understand what, what uh, populism is. And the other thing I would add to this is uh, the dynamics of such movements are incredibly important. We never know whether popul which directions populism are gonna go into, although the default position is generally uh, conservative or can be. Uh, conservative. Uh, I suppose I would use the same sorts of comment to answer or not to answer the question about religion for which I suppose inappropriately I substituted the notion of ethnic diversity. Again, I mean we really can't understand the nature of the right. What is the right? Uh, what is its form content? Its uh, causes and dynamic? We can't understand that as some sort of universal theory such as Roderick or Putnam tries to, to use, and it has to be situated. So I think, I don't think there's a general answer to your question. Uh, in response to, to Nicola's uh, important question about the class analysis of, of populism, um, I now, or for a long time, I've talked about uh, neoliberalism having had two phases, uh, and it's very important to distinguish within those phases between what is the scholarship, what are the ideology, and what is the policy and practice, and how they interact. 
with one another. They're not necessarily mutually consistent, either across time or across place or across issue. The first phase was what's been called the shock therapist, as one of Mrs. Thatcher's advisors said, just do it. Um, the second phase associated with third wayism, uh, the first phase with Washington Consensus, the second phase with uh, the post-Washington Consensus and so on, the idea that there may be piecemeal market imperfections which require institutional or state intervention to correct. Um, and in a sense, the second phase of neoliberalism was about just keep on doing it. Uh, but, you know, try and pick up some of the problems that are created, the dysfunctions, inequalities, uh, and so on. And actually within that phase, you get a change, for example, in, in the attitude at the beginning of the 2000s on privatization, first from the OECD, then from the World Bank. Oh, maybe we were too dogmatic about privatization. And um, yes, uh, we, we ought to think about the role the state can play. But actually, this was really an ideological and indeed a scholarly, scholarly coverage for something else, which became, let us use the state's resources to promote the private sector, because we've done all the privatization that we can, or that the capitalists will do, or that resistance will allow us to do. So how do we promote the private sector now? Well, we must use the state's resources to promote the private sector. I now, though, talk about a, I'll get to uh, Nicola's question in a minute. It now, I would argue we're in a third phase of neoliberalism, and I'm not sure whether this is, you know, whether would we have gone into this third phase without the crisis or not? Well, you know, it's an academic question. We've had the crest, we've had that. And really what's going on now is there's a very, very heavy pressure for the state's resources to be used to involve the private sector, private sector finance in private sector provision. And, sorry. This is most obvious in infrastructure and public-private partnerships, that really the th what we see going on now is despite, and it's nothing to do with neoliberal ideology, neoliberal ideology says you leave everything to the market, but that neoliberalism now is really about how do we keep financialization going in the wake of the crisis, and there's this big push, actually two ways, to use the state's resources to uh, fund private finance to, prov to, to uh, provide what was previously uh, public provision. And that is full of contradictions because we're pro we use the state's resources to fund the private sector through private finance because the private sector is superior to the state. I mean, it's sort of bizarre. Uh, and we also use the state's resources to convince the population that the private sector is worse than, is better than the state. So there are huge contradictions that we can, can play upon there. The other thing that's going on, and this is where the half-hearted new industrial policy is breaking out like a spring across uh, the profession, the economics profession, which actually, in effect, is how can we limit the scope of, financial, of industrial policy, not how do we expand it, is about how do you get big finance and how do you get big industry together to, uh, through the state's interventions to, to promote some sort of renewal of investment. I sort of see this as almost like Helfedink's revenge. We've got these huge financial corporations, huge global multinational productive corporations, but they need some sort of integration either through one another or not. Where does this leave the question about the role of class struggle? I think th this is what's going to drive. What I've just described is going to drive the economy. The consequences for the working class, you've guessed it, is going to be V cubed. You know, it's going to be variegated vulnerabilities and volatilities. Who knows who will get a job? Who knows who will get water? Who will get housing? Who will get under what conditions? I mean, the problem, as I've already argued, is that the nature of neoliberalism politically is one which does not allow easily organizations for the working class or to unite and struggle over those things uh, collectively. So the consequences of uh, this third phase of neoliberalism are very, very severe for certain sections of the population, particularly those who experience the, the vulnerabilities 
together, which is often the case for the most marginalized. So I do, I mean, there was a nice paper on this during the presentations, um, although I think it goes very, very deep across a number of different areas with a lot of different outcomes. But what we're going to see is a continuation of the differentiation of the working class, not just in terms of their wages or their working conditions and so on, but across every area of economic and social life, including, because it essentially, the state is now going to rely increasingly upon the private sector to remedy what has gone, what are the dysfunctions of what has gone on in the financialized form of economy. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So, thank you for the questions. So, Vacundo, we don't need to agree on things, but uh, uh, I did not say what you said, you, I said. So, this is important to keep in mind because I finished my presentation saying that we will have leftist populism competing with right wing populism. And I, I emphasize uh, throughout my presentation how populisms are different, how broad they are, and as uh, it has been highlighted by Ben. We have to look at what is going on, the way we are addressing uh, social claims, the way the state is co-opting or the state is incorporating people and uh, solving uh, deficits of democracy, because this is the point. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the experiments we had in Latin America uh, as of late, uh, they were marked by huge uh, democratic deficits it's true in Brazil, where a lot of uh, uh, minority groups like uh, black young people and uh, female uh, activists have been completely pushed out from the state. We could not participate in debates like, for instance, abortion rights in Brazil because uh, the majority uh, set up by Lula was uh, not only based, grounded on the support of the um, uh, agribusiness and the financial sector, but also on evangelicals. Evangelicals now, they are present in, in all Brazilian uh, parties, political parties, and they have around 60% of the Congress. And of course, we cannot raise, huh? it, they are in all parties. But what is fantastic is that the, the Workers' Party told us that it was not legitimate to raise questions relating to Reproductive Rights Act because otherwise the Workers' Party will lose the majority. They need the majority. So you see, they have co-opted uh, the feminist movements. They, they created a secretariat putting all women and kind of a ministry represented there, but they were not allowed to talk about issues who are absolutely fundamental for, fem for feminists. The same happened with peasants, because we moved uh, backwards in terms of agrarian reforms. We moved backwards in terms of the demarcation of indigenous uh, land, etc., etc. So I can come up with a lot of examples. And also, uh, the Workers' Party lost the support of the working class. This is very, very serious. People who were, uh, before uh, Lula, uh, Dilma's uh, second election, people were campaigning for Dilma at the entrance of the, um, the um, fabrics in Sao Paulo. And uh, you see, the Workers' Party lost all municipalities in Sao Paulo. This is very serious. They lost in all working class municipalities, where is the, the, uh, the main industrial sector in Brazil. Nobody trusts the politi uh, a political party. We took 30 years to create, because I've been involved with this. So we have to understand what is going on why things have been manipulated, why people's expectations have not been correctly addressed, and how, as uh, I think uh, Ben uh, highlighted, you see, how the Workers' Party and all the leftist party contribute to keep financialization going. This is exactly what happened in Brazil. The financial sector has backed Dilma and the Lula all throughout 14 years. And it's the only sector who did not claim for Dilma's impeachment. They were against Dilma's impeachment up to the end. And uh, two weeks ago, Temer called all industrial sectors and all the big entrepreneurs in Brazil, including the financial sector, for a meeting. And the two presidents of the largest private banks in Brazil, they did not attend the meeting. So you have to understand how otherwise, you see, you just look exactly as you said, what, what, of the picture 
that is present in the newspapers. So I think that, uh, you see, I could go on saying that in Bolivia, 83% of all people arrested in jail have never had a, 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 a fair trial. And there are uh, lots of families, indigenous families, arrested in jails in Bolivia because they uh, complained about um, uh, the, 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 the policies implemented by uh, Morales. The same happened, you see, let's talk about water. You see, uh, water has been uh, renationalized, but uh, most uh, indigenous communes have not access to water. What is being uh, mostly oriented towards minerias, so for the extractivist sector, and the extractivist sector is using a lot of water, they use in one day what a peasant family uses in five years. So let's look how the water, though being nationalized, is being redistributed. This is what we should look at. Otherwise, we're looking just at the super, the, 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 how do you say, the superficies? The surface things. The surface of things. You see, so I haven't said that right-wing populism is exactly like, but, that uh, unfortunately in Brazil, we did not, we haven't been through uh, this kind of, you see, radical populism we had in other Latin American countries, but now, because as I said, Lula was claiming that finally we could have a broad alliance, everybody's happy, everybody's making money, everybody's consuming, etc. and of course the financial sector is even uh, happier, because you see, before Lula arrived, the credit, um, a share of GDP was 21%. After Lula arrived, it was 60% of GDP, okay, by the end of Dilma's uh, mandate. So we have to understand what happened. We have spread credit. Credit is a very powerful tool uh, to support development, but it did not happen under Fernando Henrique Cardoso nor the previous government. So we have to understand how there was a huge spread in terms of financial products, you see, and a big expansion of the financial sector, and what are the outcomes of what is going on. Because otherwise, it's like many people from the Workers' Party say, ah, but Lena, why are you complaining? Because if the poor now can go to the banks, and of course they can pay 40% uh, interest rate, nominal interest rate, to buy a mixer per year. Uh, okay, guys, because the inflation is seven, we pay 40%, and this is cheap. Okay, that's okay, let's go, let's go with us. So I think that it's really necessary to examine what is going on to try to understand this new alliance between progressive governments in Latin America, the alliances they created because a very large alliance with the most conservative sectors. Just to highlight a final point, those who are back in Temer now in Congress, and maybe Temer will succeed in remaining in power, are exactly the same who backed the Workers' Party government for 14 years. So we have to understand, who are those guys? The evangelicals, the agribusiness, and the financial sector. You see, we don't have a national um, uh, industrial sector, national uh, industrialists anymore that are interested in uh, changing the country, because they all have all been financialized. You see, they all make money uh, buying public bonds, like everybody else. So this is the point. We have to understand what is going on. Otherwise, you see, you just think that, uh, talking about the people and making some stuff for the people because what was given to Brazilians is nothing. Let's not forget that under Lula's, the uh, homicide rate uh, increased every year under Lula and Dilma, every year, and it's the highest worldwide. And 75% of those killed by firearms are black young uh, men uh, ranging age ranging from uh, 15 to 29 okay so this is a genocide but nobody cared because this is not fundamental this is something marginal so we have to understand how we want to integrate this society an equal society we continue to keep to, to kill people nobody cares so what is it ah but everybody has been incorporated into the market because now everybody has some money, some cash, receive some cash for this, and of course they go to the financial sector. You can pay a, a health a funeral insurance paying one dollar per month, okay? And poor people, they pay one dollar per month because of course if somebody dies in the family, we have no cash because municipalities who use it to pay for the funeral, they don't pay anymore. So everything has been privatized everywhere. 
So regarding the religion stuff, I think that the low-income uh, households and the low-income classes have turned more and more to religion, especially in Latin America. And this is the, the rise of the evangelical movement, which is extremely powerful and with, which is also marked by trends of populism, very strong. And the, this is the case, for instance, that uh, in Rio de Janeiro we have elected uh, Rio de Janeiro is the most avant-garde city in Brazil. It has always been in the left. Majority vote for the Workers' Party. And last year, we have elected a mayor who is an evangelical. He's against everything, of course, uh, who wants to introduce religion again, uh, evangelical uh, and uh, yeah, Protestant um, uh, classes in the schools uh, who don't want to have debates on gender issues and he's against uh, gay marriage, etc. But he was elected with less than 50% of the votes, like exactly Macron, because people didn't, uh, and vote is mandatory in Brazil. So who elected this guy? The people, the low-income families, the poor, those are the guys because they talk to them. So we, we forgot to talk to people. It just provided them a, a better incorporation into the market. We had a lot of very bad outcomes and consequences that I don't have the time to highlight here. And just to finalize regarding what um, uh, Nicholas uh, highlighted, I think that you see this process of social fragmentation that we are unable to understand because um, Ben continues to talk about the working class. And it's very complicated, how? Because in our countries, informality has always been right, uh, high. So in Latin America, high informality, high unemployment rates, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried to change this, we couldn't. A very, very heterogeneous society. So the point now is that things are getting more and more fragmented. Because you see, you have low income uh, households. They have aspired to become middle class. They have those expectations like middle class. And they're completely frustrated because Though feeling middle classes, they live in uh, slums, they don't have uh, uh, treated water, they don't have good sewage. So you see, it's so complex what is going on because it's very difficult to identify how those new social identities identity will be uh, built up. So I think that this is one of our main um, uh, duties now try to understand, try to apprehend what is, how this process of social fragmentation is completely redefining, you see, also the political spectrum and, and how we have to address it. And I think it's extremely difficult. And uh, so far, I think we, we still have old categories that are not very helpful to help us in this uh, duty. So um, just a few words on, on Antoine's question. Um, I mean, your question, it's basically kind of my, my research question in the sense of, I mean, people have been saying that this strategy that non-financial corporations have been pursuing was, wasn't sustainable. I mean, um, you have people saying that like in the early 90s, so obviously it has been a really sustainable uh, strategy for non-financial corporations. So the question is why? I mean, I mean, my first year of, of PhD, so I still have a, a couple of years to, to try to uh, figure it out. But I mean, um, I mean, and and and, it, and it's obviously that non-financial corporations have found other ways. I mean, have found some way to uh, uh, to engage in this kind of strategy. And I think that basically. Uh, we have to consider like a couple of options. I mean, first is that they are basically not investing anymore because they don't need to invest because there are other firms that invest in their, uh, I mean, for them. So like, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole process of, of offshoring and outsourcing, it uh, gives an answer in, in this process. You also have the, 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 the increase in importance of what we can call a, a, an intellectual monopoly. So again, that gives uh, them a, a really high power. And, and I think that, I mean, part of the answer goes in, in these two directions, but I mean, it's an ongoing research. So that's it. So thank you very much. Uh, I will end this session now, so let's uh